I'm going, I'm really happy to do this again this semester, having our, uh, you know, IBEST lunch being taken over by our BCB students. This is really fantastic. I think you all know that we have a fantastic group of, of students uh, in BCB, and it's always fun to get updates on where they are. And, um, and so I'm excited again to, to see these talks. Um, so we've got two talks lined up for today, uh, Chava and Mason. Um, and I just want to say that uh, following the talk, we're going to have plenty of time for questions. And, and you're welcome to put questions in the chat, but um, and I can read them. But this is a small enough and friendly enough group that we can just turn on our on our audios and, and ask questions for, with, for Chava and or Mason as well. Um, and I'm sure they would appreciate that. Uh, so I will go ahead and introduce Chava. Most of you know uh, Chava is a, a, a PhD student in Ava Topps lab and has been working on um, uh, uh, antibiotic resistance and plasmid and uh, chromosome evolution in, uh, in bacterial communities. And Chava just, if you didn't know, passed his uh, proposal defense and preliminary exam last week and did an awesome job. Um, and is going to talk to us today about a part of his research, um, which is looking at the high C method of sequencing for detecting plasmid host associations in the soil. So with that, I will turn this over to Chava to share his screen and, and get us started. Thanks again, Chava, for, for volunteering to speak. All right, uh, let's see, okay. All right, well, thank you very much for everybody that came out to the talk. Um, I'm very excited to be able to give uh, my research update. Um, if you did attend my prelim, then this is going to look very familiar for you. So if there is something that didn't make sense, hopefully now it's going to click. Um, and thank you, Dave, for the introduction. And so why do we care about plasmid host associations? Well, as many of you know, antibiotic resistance is a growing global health threat. And in order to tackle this threat of spreading of antibiotic resistance, it's become more important to understand the mechanisms by which bacteria develop antibiotic resistance and the mechanisms that aid in the spread of antibiotic resistance. And so one important mechanism by which antibiotic resistance can spread well, there we go, is through plasmids. Um, plasmids are mobile genetic elements that are carried alongside bacterial chromosomes. So what you're seeing here is an example of a bacterial cell. You have this blue bacteria that carries its blue chromosome. Um, it also carries two copies of this green plasmid. Um, now there's two very important properties that plasmids have that make them very relevant for studying antibiotic resistance. The first is their ability to transfer via conjugation. Uh, conjugation happens when this blue bacteria interacts with another bacteria, uh, here this red bacteria. Um, that plasmid is going to be transferred into that red bacteria, resulting in now both of these bacteria carrying that green plasmid. Um, and so the second important property that is very related to this horizontal spread of the plasmid is that frequently these plasmids carry antibiotic resistance genes. Uh, what this means is that if this blue bacteria was originally resistant to an antibiotic because that antibiotic resistance gene was carried on the plasmid, then now both the blue bacteria and the orange bacteria or the red bacteria are going to be resistant to that antibiotic. And so our increased understanding of how plasmids contribute to the spread of antibiotic resistance has made it more important to understand the environments and the settings where the spread of plasmids is prevalent and which could be contributing to the spread of resistance plasmids to uh, human pathogens. One such setting is farm and feedlots. Uh, farm and feedlot settings are understood to be important in the development of antibiotic resistance due to the overuse of antibiotics in the sector. When antibiotics are given to food producing animals, the bacteria on these animals develop antibiotic resistance. The antibiotic resistant bacteria and those antibiotic resistance genes can then get to humans through food chain or contact, or the alternative pathway, which my research focuses on, is through fertilizer containing animal feces. Um, it's a very common agricultural practice to use the feces from farm animals, whether it be uh, pig, poultry, cows, or any other far, farm animals, um, and apply that to agricultural soil to supplement plant growth. Um, once those antibiotic resistance genes that go from the animals to the feces to the soil, uh, once they enter the soil, they can come back once again to us through food chain, water, or contact. Um, and so the big question that my research is attempting to address is what is happening in this step? Um, there's a lot that we still don't know about the fate of plasmids coming from manure to soil. And importantly, we don't understand what the fate of these plasmids are. And additionally, who are the bacteria that acquire and retain these plasmids once that manure is applied to agricultural soil? 
And so these knowledge gaps in our understanding of plasma spread in agricultural soil are due in large part to the current limitations of methods that are used. Um, three of the main methods that have been used to study plasma spread in agricultural soil are cultivation-based, metagenomic, and fluorescence-based methods. With cultivation-based methods, only one to 3% of soil bacteria are culturable, uh, which leaves a huge gap in our knowledge on the bacteria that acquire these plasmids. Um, with metagenomic methods, we're unable to identify the host of the resistance genes. And so while we can say that maybe that plasmid is present or that resistance gene is present, we don't know what are the bacteria that are carrying these genes. Um, and then with fluorescence-based methods, not all bacteria express fluorescence. Um, additionally, this requires a modification of the plasmid and or host. Uh, to circumvent these limitations, we are using the HICE method. HICE is culture independent and it requires no modification of the plasmid for detection. Importantly, it also allows us to link the plasmid to its host without modification of the environmental community. Um, to give you a better idea of what this looks like, um, the way the HICE in the HICE -E approach works is we can imagine this very simple bacterial community or this very simple environmental sample where we have a red bacteria with a green plasmid and a blue bacteria with a yellow plasmid. The first step of the HICE -E method is to cross-link the DNA uh, that's represented by these black dots here. Um, so these are actual physical links between the DNA within the cell that is in close proximity. Uh, the cell is then lysed and the DNA is digested at restriction sites. And importantly, you'll notice that now we have these fragments of DNA that are still cross-linked. So this is still representing those fragments of DNA that were in close proximity within that original cell. The DNA is then ligated at restriction sites, followed by the removal of those crosslinks that we generated at the beginning of the protocol, in addition of adapters for sequencing. The important thing to notice here is that now you'll see that there's these chimeric fragments of DNA that now represent fragments of DNA that aren't just chromosomal DNA or plasmid DNA, but represent contact between plasmid DNA and chromosomal DNA within that cell. So when we do paradigm read sequencing, we can use that information to see that, oh, that green plasmid was originally carried by that orange bacteria, and that yellow plasmid was carried in the blue bacteria. Using this approach, the research I'm going to be presenting to you today, um, the goal is to demonstrate the feasibility of the HICE -E method for its use on soil and to determine the detection limit of the HICE -E method. And so we're interested in determining the detection limit of HIC because our, our long-term goal is to apply, to use HIC to monitor the spread of a resistance plasmid in soil. However, we need to know at what limit the HIC method will no longer be able to detect that plasmid in that community. Um, and so in order to do this detection limit, we set up, uh, we wanna mimic the scenario where manure is applied to agricultural soil. The manure we can imagine carries plasmid donors. These are bacteria that carry a green plasmid. This would be the plasmid that we're interested in. Um, and the agricultural soil has recipients. These are bacteria that are able to acquire that resistance plasmid, uh, but don't already have it. When manure is applied to agricultural soil, um, that donor is gonna transfer the plasmid via conjugation to the recipient, resulting in transconjugants. So now this transconjugant in the agricultural soil would also carry that plasmid. As opposed to adding the donor to manure amended soil and trying to see how much it spreads in that community, we opted to create mock scenarios. And so these mock scenarios were composed of a specific donor, recipient, and transconjugant that were added to soil in specific amounts. Um, and then we immediately applied the HICE method. And so by adding a known amount of a donor and transconjugant and recipient, we can accurately quantify the limits of HICE in detecting each of those players. And so to give you a better idea of what this looks like, we ended up making, or we made a total of seven mock scenarios. And so these are shown here, A through F, and then a control scenario. We first added um, an amount of soil into each one of these tubes. The amount of soil bacteria were first quantified using qPCR targeting the 16S RNA gene. Um, importantly, the soil bacteria are still present in these communities. So this is really uh, mimicking what we would expect to, our samples to look like when we actually do our full experiment. After adding the soil into these tubes, we added our specific amount of the donor, the recipient, and the transconjugate, as I mentioned before. As donor, we use E. coli K12. As recipient, we use Pseudomonas putida, and our plasmid of interest that we're using in this study is uh, plasmid PB10, which is multi-drug resistant and has been previously detected in manure. Um, and so we have the donor, which carried that plasmid, and the transconjugate, which was the Pseudomonas putida, also with that plasmid. Um, importantly, our control scenario had an isogenic E. coli K12 strain without the plasmid, and there was no transconjugate added. So our control served to control for the possible detection of other similar plasmids in soil or any errors that could come up with the HIC method itself and sequencing errors. After we added the bacteria to each of these scenarios, we applied the HIC method 
Um, and then we did paired and read sequencing, as mentioned before. And then we use our data analysis consisted of using a Python script, which extracts and counts the paired end reads, where one read aligns to PP10, which is our plasmid, and the other to PPTIDA or E. coli. So these chimeric fragments of DNA that I mentioned earlier can be used to identify that donor, which was the PP10 E. coli reads, and the transconjugate, which is those PP10 PPTIDA reads. And so now let's take a closer look at what those scenarios are actually composed of. Uh, what you're seeing here is a table with the percentage of donor and transconjugate in each mock scenario. Um, the soil bacteria and the recipient are also present, but for the sake of simplicity and because these are the ones we're interested in, which is uh, detecting the links between that plasmid and either the Pseudomonas or the E. coli, um, I'm going to focus on the donor and transconjugate. And so we have the percentage that they make up in each scenario, and each scenario is here on the left and the control scenario. Um, there's a couple of things that I want to point out on this table. Um, the first is that our scenario A served as a positive control. So I mentioned that we first wanted to establish the feasibility of high C for its application on soil. Um, that's what this scenario A served for. We created a mock community where the transconjugate was present in a very high amount, 50% of the total bacteria, um, in order to assess whether the high C method could be used to successfully detect that transconjugate. This was included in a preliminary set of experiments, so I won't show that data. Um, and the rest of the data I'm going to show is going to be focused on the rest of these experiments or the rest of these scenarios. Um, second, the amount of transconjugate decreases in each scenario tenfold from B to F. So we go from 10% all the way down to 0.001%. Doing this by decreasing the amount of transconjugate that is present in each scenario, in each scenario we can accurately quantify when the Heist method is unable to detect this transconjugate. The amount of donor is the same in each scenario, so it is 0.01% in all of these scenarios. Um, so this also allows us to see whether the high C method will have some trouble detecting the transconjugate where the donor is also present. And lastly, the control scenario is included to which no plasmid is added. So while it does have the E. coli, it doesn't have any plasmid DNA, same thing with no transconjugate being added. Um, and so to give you a better idea of what this numbers of cells this actually looks like, uh, we can take a look at scenario F. Um, and so as I mentioned, we first quantified the amount of soil bacteria. This was quantified to be 5.28 times 10 to the 8 bacteria per gram of soil. Um, and so based on this number, we then added um, the amount of bacteria required to reach these specific percentages. So we added 5.28 times 10 to the 5th donors per gram of soil and 5.28 times 10 to the 3 transconjugates per gram of soil. And so what you're looking at here now is the results of that experiment. So as I mentioned before, once we created these mock scenarios, we applied the high C method and then we did paired end read sequencing and found the links that identified the presence of the donor or the transconjugate. And that's what you're seeing here. Uh, we have the mock scenarios on the X axis. So we have scenarios B through F and then the control. Um, and then on the Y axis is the number of links detected. And so these are the links that indicate once again, the presence of that donor or transconjugate. Uh, the donor is shown in blue, the transconjugate in orange. And so for, as you'll notice, the typical trend that we observe is similar to the amount of bacteria we added. The amount of donor stays relatively consistent, and we do observe that tenfold decrease in our transconjugate. Um, however, the goal of this experiment was to determine the detection limit. In order to do that, we need to look at scenarios F and the control scenario. Um, and so what we found, or before I go to that, um, so you'll notice that the control scenario did also have plasmid DNA detected. However, we didn't add any plasmids. Um, and so let's take a closer look at what we actually detected there. What you're seeing here now is the coverage of the plasmid in the control scenario. Um, and so here is the genome coordinates for the plasmid. So this represents the length of the entire plasmid. Um, and we have whatever E. coli PB10 reads were found are shown in blue. Whatever uh, Pseudomonas putida PB10 or transconjugate reads were shown in orange. Uh, we found a total of 55 reads indicating the presence of the donor, two indicating the presence of transconjugate. Um, and as you'll notice, there was a significant spike around here at 40,000 base pairs where all the donor reads aligned. All those reads, as well as this orange read on the right, align to a TN5-like transposon. Uh, TN5 transposons are common amongst bacteria, um, so we expect that this could actually be um, some TN5 that are actually present in soil bacteria and not so much our plasmid. Um, additionally, the other transconjugate read was, that was detected was an antibiotic resistant gene, which once again isn't specific to our plasmid. And so now let's take a look at scenario F. Um, the donor reads are significantly higher than the controls and don't provide us um, as much information when comparing these two scenarios. So I'm only going to show you the transconjugate reads. Um, and so we detected five reads that indicating the presence of the transconjugate in scenario F. Four of those were genes involved in conjugation and one was a TN5 gene. 
Um, and so as compared to the control scenario where all of it was genes that could be from our soil bacteria, these were genes that are specific to our plasmid. Um, and so from this, we were able to conclude that scenario F is where the detection limit lies because we did detect these plasmid specific genes. Um, and so to conclude my talk, uh, we concluded that high c can be successfully used to monitor the presence of a plasmid and its host in soil. Additionally, we determined that the high c can associate a plasmid with its host when plasmid hosts are present at 0.001% of the total bacterial community, or 10 to the negative 5. Uh, this also corresponds to 5.28 times 10 to the 3 bacteria per gram of soil. Um, our future work is going to consist of creating a math model that can be used to predict the amount of bacteria carrying the plasmid based on high c data. Um, so the data we have now um, saying that there's a certain amount of high C links isn't as useful as being able to say that this corresponds to a certain amount of bacteria. Uh, so we're going to be using these mock scenarios we created to um, create a math model that can be used to relate high C read counts to bacteria per gram of soil. Um, and then lastly, we're going to work on increasing the detection limit of the high C method by coupling it with a target capture approach aimed at enriching with PB10 reads. Um, and so lastly, I'd just like to give acknowledgements to Dr. Ava Topp and Dr. Thibault Stalder, um, as well as to the funding from the USDA and student funding, which was provided by the BCV program in partnership with IBES and the NSF Beacon Center. And also a big thank you to the IBES Genomics Researchers Corps. Um, they've all been very helpful in getting this project going. Um, and so with that, I will now be happy to take any questions. Awesome. Thank you, Chava. Can I ask a question? Go for it. Yeah. Um, I was really fascinated by this technique. Um, I, I, as a statistician, I'm still not really understanding why you would see those reads in the control sample. So um, there's one part that I didn't mention because I haven't confirmed it. Um, but part of it could, what I Ava um, helped me realize just last week is that um, the E. coli that we use in our experiment also carries that TN5. It was used to insert a GFP. Um, however, that insertion is missing in the reference sequence. So the reference sequence for our E. coli doesn't include that TNP or that TN5, but the reference for our PB10 does. So what I think is actually happening is that the TN5 we're detecting is from the E. coli, but because that reference genome doesn't have the TN5 in it, it's aligning those all to the plasmid. Um, alternatively, this could just be soil bacteria because our high C method doesn't just detect the bacteria we added. Um, there's 97% of the reads that I didn't show because they're all soil bacteria that are unaligned. Um, and these could all also have the TN5. So if there's um, some links being generated between a TN5 and anything that has a significant homology to our E. coli genome, then those could also show up as plasmid E. coli. Um, but yeah, in the future, um, I'm going to be working with Dr. Ben Wright and Howard to try to um, do some form of statistics to try to uh, tease out some of the noise that might be happening there. I see. Very cool. Thanks. I think you probably just answered my question, too, but I was going to ask why you have so few reads for many of your samples, but that's probably because all of it's being eaten up by all the other soil bacteria, right? Yeah, and in each of our scenarios, 90% of it is soil bacteria. Um, and so it's, it's a, a lot of data that's not so relevant for us, but it serves for a long-term goal, which is those soil bacteria are going to be present in our experiment too. So I want to take that into account. Hey, Chava, I have a kind of can of worms, um, maybe unfair question. Um, there's going to be a lot of other factors that are at play in a real field sample. So I was wondering, like, do different kinds of bacteria accept a donor at the same rate? What other factors are you um, going to tug at to determine, to build that statistical model that would predict the abundance? So the model is not going to take into account um, the, like, donor dynamics or, like, the effectiveness of the, the ability of the plasmid to be able to transfer to other bacteria. Um, part of the reason is because we don't know how many bacteria in soil are able to acquire that plasmid, right? So we can't really factor that into our model. And um, so at the simplest end, our models are going to be just a linear relation of high C reads um, to our um, amount of plasmid containing bacteria. And we do have some more complex methods that can be used to incorporate some errors due to like sequencing. And so using some Bayesian approaches, but 
um, it won't be able to take into account the different dynamics of donors and plasma transfer and things like that because it just it's things we don't know. Shav, I have a question. That was cool. Thanks. Um, I was, it was maybe it was too fast and I just didn't understand everything, but shouldn't the detection limit be a little dependent on the amount of sequencing you get for it? Like if you just sequence more, there's still like 5,000 bacteria that you put in there. And if you sequence more, you should be able to get theoretically all of them. Yeah. Right? So uh, there's something I'm missing. No, you're a hundred percent right. So I didn't mention that, but this detection limit is dependent on your sequencing depth. Uh, you're very, right, that if you do sequence deeper, you are going to have a deeper detection limit. So our model will incorporate that. It'll take into account your sequencing depth um, and how that'll affect the detection. I guess then my other question was, have you looked at all the other reads to see what, if there's plasmids in the other bacteria or what's getting linked up? And Yeah, so I, I started, um, but I haven't gone too deep into the analysis. There are other plasmids. Um, unfortunately, in the analysis, it didn't I didn't find any that were like a similar PB10 to some unknown bacteria, um, but I did start detecting a lot of like soil plasmids um, linking to soil bacteria, but I didn't get deep enough into the analysis to be able to give you any further insight into that. But yeah, it's something that it's, I've played around with a bit is trying to get some information out of all those other high C reads. Do you have a non high C metagenomic data set for that same sample that you can do genome assemblies with or? No. We will, in the next part of the experiment, once we start doing our long-term tracking of plasmid in, in barley rhizosphere, we're going to be doing uh, metagenomic assemblies for just soil to be able to start doing some of those analyses. Cool. So that was actually my question too, with JT, whether you saw this, your plasmid from your experiment getting incorporated into other bacteria that are in the soil. And do you think, so you said you didn't find any of those. Do you think that's just because of the timing? Like you just didn't, it was, you said you immediately, you know, went yeah. right to high C with these to sequencing and so, or is there something else going on there? Um, so I think part of it could be due to the alignment. Um, this is part of what I don't fully understand of what exactly is being done in the filtering um, because I get rid of any reads that aren't aligned to the reference genome. So I think what might be happening is if there is anything that's like PB10 linked to a soil bacteria, which would be an unknown, that gets tossed out. Uh, so essentially what I'm planning to do is uh, split everything up into single reads and then align to PB10 and see what I detect there. Because as of now, um, I didn't see any, but I, I'm a little surprised because there are um, PB10 like plasmids or NP plasmids in soil and such. So I expected to detect those to some extent. Um, but I think it might just be in the way that I did the filtering and alignment that it got rid of a lot of that if it was present. Cool. Thanks. Okay. Thank you very much for the questions. They're wonderful. So I had a quick question about um, application. Um, so would it be that you would envisage tracking plasmids that cause antibiotic resistance in, in the hospital and then looking for those things being transferred around in agriculture or how, how would it work? I mean, knowing what's out there is all well and good, but it has to be relatable back to, to the healthcare setting and such. Yeah, definitely. So a big aspect of it is being able to identify the hosts. Um, and so part of it is, can we identify which are the dominant bacteria that are retaining these plasmids in a bacterial community in soil? Um, are these bacteria that we have identified to be spreading through me or through plants? Um, and so trying to identify some of the dominant, um, how can I say this, some of the patterns that are emerging from that data set. Um, it's hard to link that directly to saying this is the same plasma that we found here that is linked to an environmental setting. Um, but I think what we have here, there's really a lot that is unknown of that link between um, manure amended soil and farms. However, as we start, or in hospitals, as we start to kind of like fill in the, the pieces of the puzzle with small bits of information, we can gain a bigger understanding of how this is connected. Right, these are the baby steps, right? With the yeah. technique. There's a lot of samples you could trial and look at and oh, yeah. track. Yeah, okay, I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. Great talk. Thank you. Any other questions for Chava? All right. Thanks again. That was awesome. Appreciate it. Thank you it. all.
Okay, uh, I think we can uh, move right along um, on to our next talk um, by one of our senior BCB students, which is, uh, which is great to, to see what Mason's been up to. So Mason is a PhD student with Christine Parent, um, has been working on shell ornamentation in mollusks and land snails primarily. And he's going to talk to us today about recognizing and predicting global patterns of molluscan shell ornamentation expression through machine learning. Uh, totally BCB project integrating pretty much all aspects of BCB here. So that's pretty, that's cool. I'm excited to see this. Thanks, Mason. Yeah, sorry guys. Um, hi everybody, uh, my name is Mason and one second I gotta minimize some stuff. And I'm gonna be talking today about uh, molluscan shell ornamentation. And unless you're uh, a malacologist, you probably don't know what molluscan shell ornamentation is. And so um, molluscan shell ornamentation are the things on the left, which are these extensions from the shell. They're these like hard concretions. They're made of calcium carbonate usually. And they can use their these spines that can be extending off that can be this highly modified shape like the keel or in the bottom these parallel ribs on the right are many things maybe people would consider to be ornaments or not necessarily in like terms of a functional word of ornamentation not like lacking a particular uh, function but um, i don't consider color or any kind of unique pattern to be shell ornamentation so for the talk we're going to be talking about the things on the left, these extensions of calcium carbonate away from the shell. Molluscan shell ornamentation comes in three distinct types. There's these spine extensions or knobs, which are on the left. And in the center are these ribs, and they can be parallel uh, with the opening, as you see on top, or they can be arming in the middle, or they can be against the opening, uh, as in the top and bottom. And then there's keeled forms where there's a strong uh, angle that's produced on the outer opening in the shell. Now, ornamented forms are found throughout uh, mollusks and terrestrial freshwater and marine environments. And they're known to be distributed across a really wide uh, taxonomic breadth as well. So, <laughs> You all may know a lot of my research is on land snail ornamentation, particularly in North American land snails in the genus Oreo helix. And one of the patterns that I've documented during my dissertation is that as you move towards a limestone outcrop, ornamentation expression increases. And that expression can be a bit uh, variable in terms of whether or the transition between a smooth form and an ornamented form. It can be very brief or it can be very long. And the example on the left, there was a very sharp transition and these survey points denoted, uh, denoted here on the map, where it goes from smooth to uh, a red to the ornamented form and blue and purple is the transition zone. And these are also shown on the pictures on the right. On the left, you have the smooth form and the gradual transition to the fully ornamented variety. And in Oreo helix, you often have just ribs being developed, such as the vertical ribs on the top or the parallel ribs on the bottom. So this pattern got me thinking that this may not be unique to Oreo helix, that could be across a lot of different other land snail groups, that calcium carbonate may be driving a lot of patterns of increased biomineralization expression. And indeed, once I moved outside of land snail shell world, um, I realized that this is a recognized thing, particularly in the marine realm, where we know that environmental calcium modifies the biomineralization uh, patterns of expression that these mollusks have, in particular in relation to defense or resisting heat and so forth. But there hasn't really been a approach that looks at the broad scale association of calcium carbonate availability and ornamentation expression and greater biomineralization across the globe, except for one study that was done in 2012. And this is probably the most broad sampling that's been done, where uh, in this study, Sue Ann Watson and her colleagues surveyed 12 sites for mollusks and brachiopods and collected at 30 meter depth across the globe and then examined percent or inorganic content as a proxy for percent biomineralization. So if more biomineralized shells should have a higher inorganic content or greater calcium carbonate content uh, reflected. And they found <clears throat> that 
ornamentation, or not ornamentation, sorry, calcium carbonate uh, biomineralization expression decreased as you went more away from uh, the equator. And that's something that's been recognized in a lot of systems is that towards the equator, you often have greater biomineralization expression. And this is also associated with temperature. So as you move towards the poles, it gets colder. colder. And this has been known to, it's been hypothesized that this association is due to a couple of things. One is, is that there's increased predators towards the equator. And another one is what's called the um, saturation state hypothesis or the omega hypothesis, which is that basically there's a greater concentration of calcium carbonate in the water towards the equator. And this is actually known to be true, but whether that has an effect on mall shell morphology is something that's been proposed, but not definitively evaluated. It's one of the hypotheses they propose in their paper. And so in the marine realm, um, I should say in any solution, uh, water or otherwise, you can have uh, chemical compounds that are in that solution. And if they reach a saturation point, they can no longer dissolve into the solution. In the ocean, due to various geochemical factors, uh, it's mostly super saturated with respect to calcite or aragonite, the two dominant polymorphs of calcium carbonate. So that towards the poles, uh, and uh, so I should also say calcium carbonate polymorphs increase in solubility with uh, decreasing temperature. And so that towards the poles, saturation state decreases, or, and then towards the equator as it warms up, saturation state increases. And this is really relevant for studying mollusk shell morphology because into the future, so this is pre-industrial saturation state values on the left. And on the right, we have under the uh, GCP 8.5 high emission scenario, what we expect aragonate saturation state to look like in the year 2100. So the, world, the ocean's gonna become more corrosive with respect to calcium carbonate and such that we may see a really rapid shift in morphology or extirpation of species that rely on this resource for producing their extremely biomineralized exoskeletons. And so there's this need to understand what are the ecological factors driving ornamentation, whether calcium carbonate expression like it is in Oreo helix, really important for ornamentation expression in marine snails. And so this gets to the first part of the, uh, the project is we need to recognize current patterns to predict future responses. And so the questions that we have and what we need to recognize are what species possess ornamentation, what um, species are most likely to be affected by changes in the ecological parameters that could alter ornamentation's expression. How is ornamentation distributed spatially? What regions may be affected by these um, by scenarios of climate change? And then what are the ecological associates and how are they going to change under these different climate change scenarios? And addressing these questions really is very difficult, particularly at a global scale. And so I say there's a corollary that needs to be added to the first uh, proposal is that we need large amounts of data to really accurately assess these current patterns. And so what I decided to do and what we decided to implement was to generate a large amount of data to understand ornamentation distribution. We need a large data set of ornamented forms spatially across the globe. And so we decided to do this through um, object detection and using the YOLO algorithm. And so for those of you that aren't familiar with object detection, basically uh, it's a way of training a machine vision model to recognize certain classes that you teach it. So <clears throat> in this image, there's a model that's been trained to recognize the dog class, bicycle class, and car, and then it like draws a box around and say, this is where the bicycle is in the image. This is where the dog is in the image, or this is where the car is. And the only look once algorithm is one uh, form of those things, uh, form of those object detecting algorithms that you, it's very fast and only looks at the image once and then it's very quick at doing this. So our pipeline was to basically use this uh, object detection algorithm on geotagged images from across the globe to generate a rapid spatially tagged morphological data set of ornamented, smooth, and slug uh, gastropods. And so we develop a, we, the proposal is to develop a yellow object detector for models, apply it to all these geotagged images, ignore images with no shell or a slug present, and then assign classes to these reliably classified species. So basically we need to classify images, associate them with the species, and then we can, once we have a, 
a good uh, morphology tag for the species, we can gather all records for that species and then input that data into a random forest classifier for ornaments and models using current conditions and then apply those to future conditions. And so we did this. We developed a yellow object detector and it was really successful. So we trained it on a 12,249 image training data set, um, 2,000 for each class, ornaments and mollusks, smooth mollusks, slugs, and 6,000 of empty background images of the ocean or um, a forest or any other background that you'd normally find a snail in. And then we had validated it on a 500 image validation test uh, set. And we got a mean average precision of 90.11, a false positive rate of 8.7 and a false negative rate of 11.6. So this is the uh, image you all saw before. Uh, this on the left, there's a variety of ornaments and malls here. So let's apply that image classification algorithm to this image and see how it does. And so it gets all of them except for perhaps the most ornamented mollusk here that has these really large extrusions of the spine. And so I haven't really been able to fully resolve the extremely spiny form issue, but it gets them a lot of times, as you can see on the bottom left. But for whatever reason, that particular variety of mollusk with, it has the really long uh, drop down spine coming it down has been very difficult to associate, but they're a relatively small fraction of the species that we have in our data set. And now this image is important. We applied it also to this image that I showed you earlier, showing the transition from smooth to ornamented because the image classifier only does as well, or it only classifies images based on what I tell it to classify. I say that this image, I give it a training set of this is the ornamented, this is smooth. My boundaries of what is ornamented or smooth will shape this data set quite a bit. And so we applied it to this and it got them right, where on the far left, I said it was smooth, but any form of weak ornamentation, even those from the second from the left are considered ornamented. And so when I say something is ornamented, I'm including the whole gradient from weak, medium to strong. And this is what it looks like when you use it. You enter in an image path and you get back these percent confidence uh, that it is in the, its ID, its classification of the image and where it is on the image. And so it identified that there were um, smooth mollusks in all of these different uh, images very well. And then, uh, so another thing to mention with this model is that classifications were kept if only 90% of all detections were in one category in an image. And so in this example on the right, we would not have kept the, this in our data set because there's one slug and one snail. And so because there's like 50% uh, smooth form and 50% slug, we wouldn't use that in our tabulation. And then species were only kept at greater than 90% of all those images were in one category, smooth, ornamented, or slug. And so this leads to a certain bias in our data set towards species that are polymorphic or that are often photographed with other species. Um, so a lot of iNaturalist observations got pro uh, probably got tossed out during this step I haven't gone through and quantified that exactly. However, and so then what we would do is after classifying these images, we would go to all those points and mine for ecological data. And so we extracted um, various 19 and 13 oceanic environmental variables from BioOracle and Mars spec. They were at 10 kilometer resolution. And then we used a bathymetry scaled aragonite layer, um, a saturation state map that is natively at the one kilometer resolution, but then we upscaled it to 10 kilometer resolution. Then we applied this through a random forest classifier to, like I said before, and um, using a lot of the default values in the random forest package. And this resulted in 364,026 images being classified and 28,000 species with an image and 14,989 species were reliably classified. But of those, only 6,899 were ornamented and 4,502 marine species were ornamented. So what we noticed is that a lot of marine species are ornamented compared to land snail species, for instance. The land snail, there was only 14.71% of land snail species were ornamented. And so this is one of the really big, cool things about this um, project is that previously there hasn't been this broad scale assessment of 
where ornamentation is and how it's distributed across the system, um, across Mollusca. We knew that there were more in marine uh, taxa, but we weren't necessarily sure how much more. And this really gives us kind of an idea at what scale, um, how different the marine taxa are and freshwater and land snail taxa are from each other in terms of ornamentation expression. And this resulted then after grabbing species uh, localities for those classified, um, reliably classified species, 1.6 million localities for all gastropods and 1.4 million that were terrestrial. So that left only 238,000 localities for marine. And then after cleaning and mining the ecological data, we came to a final data set of 75,523 localities. And so on this map is the uh, terrestri uh, terrestrial land snails that we found, or terrestrial uh, mollusks that we were able to mine. We didn't end up using them in an analysis, but they will be used for some future study. Then here are all of our data points for the marine taxa. And then here they are classified into ornaments that are smooth. And you can clearly see that there does seem to be a greater proportion of smooth things towards the north and far south, but it's not that they're completely excluded. So that our expectations of maybe ornamentation being absent from Antarctica or North Pole isn't true. There are some ornamented forms there, but they just seem to be at lower proportion. And so when we looked at the taxonomic distribution of ornamentation from this, we found that the most ornamented land snail families were the Eurocoptidae, Syrianidae, and Pomatidae. That's not really a surprise. And the most smooth marine snail families were the Cypraeidae, Marginellidae, and Naticidae. Roughly half of all marine and terrestrial land snail families had at least one ornamented member, which is really surprising because it's been previously assumed that at least in land snails, that ornamentation was restricted to only a few isolated uh, groups, but it seems that throughout land snails there's at least one ornamented member in half of all families. And here are some example of our variable ranges that were um, we thought would be really important for our random forest classifier. So we did this analysis, we classified points into ornamented or smooth, and we got, we and we assessed variable importance, and we found that mean temperature max temperature, minimum temperature, and dissolved oxygen, as well as aragonite saturation state were the most uh, important variables. However, we had a pretty big out of the bag error rate, which shows that the model could probably really be improved. And this is for um, mean decrease in Gini index. And this is for mean decrease in accuracy. We have roughly the same grouping of variables for this, but aragonite saturation state falls down a little bit in the hierarchy. So then we apply this under RCP 8.5, um, where mean temperature goes up, max temperature goes up, minimum temperature goes up, phosphate concentration stays the same, so this is all oxygen, and aragonite saturation state and salinity are predicted to go down globally. And we found that ornamented occurrence decreases by 10,266 at sampled localities, and smooth forming occurrences increase by the same amount, and we didn't predict, predict slugs. So one of the important things about this model and what's potentially like a flaw in this approach and something we're working on. And so this project's not finished yet. We're still working on trying to find new methods to implement for the analysis side. We think the data set generation is pretty good right now. Our data, I trust it, but I think that there's needs to be another set of um, random forest or some other machine uh, learning algorithm applied to understand the, how we can extrapolate this to future conditions because we had a high relatively high out of the bag error rate for our random forest classifier. And this model assumes that it's either smooth or ornamented when really the premise of our hypothesis is that for an ornamented form to exist, there has to be a certain level of aragonite saturation state. And so it's not necessarily that if an ornamented form is there, a smooth form isn't there. It's that an ornamented form is permitted to exist where there's more calcium carbonate. It doesn't, necess it doesn't necessitate its existence. And so we're going to probably be applying uh, various species distribution models in the future to try to model this morphology across the globe. And so I would take these results with a little bit of, uh, it's still a work in progress. We're still trying to figure out how to interpret and what variables are more important for um, ornamentation expression uh, into the future. And so I think that uh, I would take these results a, a little bit cautiously right now, but I do agree that ornamentation expression is definitely predicted to decrease um, 
but I wouldn't necessarily trust it being by that amount. And I'd like to acknowledge everybody who's helping with this project, uh, Yannick, uh, Andrew, Anna Wetting, one of my undergrads, and uh, Brandon Larson, another undergrad, and all the various societies that funded my dissertation over the years. And of course, my advisor, Christine. Thanks. Wow, that's fascinating, uh, Mason. Thank you for that talk. Um, I'm sure there are a lot of questions. I'm going to ask a question first <laughs> uh, yeah. because I unmuted myself first. Um, I'm curious about the results of the um, terrestrial and and marine uh, differences in terms of the amount of ornamentation. I know that there, you know, from your stuff before, there are ecological biomechanical reasons to be ornamented or, or hypotheses about why having ornamentation is there. I'm, and so I'm curious whether you have any thoughts about, about why the marine uh, has such a high, much higher prevalence of ornamentation compared to land snails um, or, or gastropods on the land. And then also sort of in the same line how you think the phylogeny or phylogenetic history may actually explain some of this as well. Uh, you showed some taxonomic results, which I assume are tied to the, the phylogeny. Are we just, are, are ornamented things just more species rich uh, in terms of their maybe diversification rates or something like that? Um, see if you, what you have to say about those things. Yeah, so, um... First off, the main proposal for why there's predicted to be more ornamented things in the marine realm is simply because the marine realm has been saturated with calcium carbonate. It's the ongoing hypothesis, at least, is that there's just more calcium carbonate that allows for more biomineralization. So it's this like vague thing that we've always proposed but never really tested. And so that's really just what everybody's kind of assumed. And in the um, terrestrial realm, it's been assumed that they maybe so there's another hypothesis too in addition to the calcium carbon is that in the marine realm that they have more higher density of predators or predation intensity is much higher than in the um, terrestrial realm and I don't necessarily fully agree with that either um, I don't think there's there's been studies that show yes that predation intensity is greater towards the tropics but there is a predominance there is ornamentation expression towards the poles as well and it does occur outside the range of a lot of conventional predators ranges that we invoke for explaining ornamentation distribution. And so really it's a combination of the resource and predator thing for explaining the difference between supposedly land snails and marine snails. And then also for land snails in regards to like species diversity and marine snails and ornamentation, um, there are definitely more described species as a result of ornamentation expression in the land snail world. But every time that land snail ornamentation has been investigated, it's been shown to be an extremely recent divergence, like a form or like it may be a morph. So maybe there are these ephemeral, definitely genetically divergent things that emerge. And then in association with some ecological factor, which I believe to be limestone outcrops, but then they just don't fully complete this adaptive speciation process, or they just kind of get it locally extinct, or there's ongoing gene flow so often with their you know, source population that keeps them. So I don't necessarily think there is an, an increase in speciation or diversification rate in land snails yet um, with ornamentation, but I would say in the marine realm, definitely it has a functional purpose that resource is relatively stable through time. And I haven't tested that yet, but that'd be my suspicion. So building on from that then is, is there any is there any evidence of changes in ornamentation in the geological record? And could you apply this technique to looking at fossils? Because of course there's, so, been, there's been big changes in climate and CO2 levels and, and global temperatures over the geology. So you could certainly apply this technique to, to that, that realm of, of data. Yeah, actually. So I attempted to apply the image recognition algorithm to fossils with some positive early results, it had like a 65% like mean average precision, but it wasn't trained on fossils either. So it was, it's pretty, it's pretty good. Um, but I will say that that is a part of the PRFB I wrote actually this year is to look at those in the fossil record and on the phylogeny mapping 
these um, resources that we think are invo inv like involved in these physiologically important processes for important traits, functionally important traits, and then seeing if we can look at branching on the tree in the context of those periods of elevated resource changes. And so that's work that's ongoing. Um, and I will say one of the biggest, so like, you know, the Cambrian explosion is a huge deal, but one of the hypotheses for why it happened in mollusks and other calcifying groups is that there was a huge increase in calcium release before the onset of the Cam Cambrian explosion. But that hasn't really been, I think, fully vetted yet, to my knowledge, but I'm not a paleontologist either. Have a that time. was super oh. duper cool. Um, I want to give Dave the award of asking the predictable phylogenetic question, but I was curious if you could use hey, that in the, reverse, <laughs> in the wow. reverse direction. Like if you could identify families that are associated with um, ornamentation, if they have genomic resources available, could you identify um, genetic uh, drivers of ornamentation? in the reverse direction. So oh, and then, uh, sorry, a second question is um, whether you use um, any biotic variables in your um, ornamentation prediction. Uh, the plan, sorry, so I'll get to the second one first, actually, if that's all right. So the plan was to include biotic variables, um, but ultimately, like this, is a, like, this is a bit of an ongoing work right now. Like we just, like we finished getting the data in like the, a really good stage right now and we we're, we're trying out different things. And so this is actually kind of like what I presented a little bit older of what we've been doing. I've been building a bunch of different SDMs and stuff, but I want to include a biotic predictor. I just haven't found one that I, I, I know there are some, but I just haven't found one that I thought was really suitable because I'd really like one that depicts crab crushing predation over fish because predation right now. And I know that there's probably some synthesis of a lot of those. At, um, and the I just haven't found it yet. I haven't applied it, so no. And then for the first one, there's actually a paucity of genomic resources for a lot of mollusks, particularly in the marine realm. And so, and it, like I, the genome that we're producing is the first one for, you know, an ornamented land snail group. All the rest of them are extremely smooth. Um, and so I don't necessarily know if there will be, the only genomic insights that may come for ornamentation expression would be probably from Oreo helix and not necessarily from other ones right now. Hey Mason, I got a, a question on like uh, the image recognition. So is it like, um, are you like looking in created image database or it's basically you take all the image, I don't know, that are available on the web and finding all the image with a, a snail? So that actually gets a big division at, like during the development of this project, it came down to like doing one or two things. And that is to just ignore species and like the taxonomic assignments, like use GBIF, like which has like taxonomic assignments for everything, which is what we did. And we decided to go with that approach because it allowed us to get more records because it could allow us to access things that did not have images associated with them by assigning them to species. But another is that we could include dirty data where we just get any geotagged image data, which there's a lot of online from um, Flickr, for instance, and other huge image data sets. And then just say, there's an ornamented thing there, we have a GPS point, but there's like a bit of like data cleaning there that's taken care of by GBIF that I didn't want to necessarily do. And so I didn't necessarily go for the, take the whole internet and throw it through my, <laughs> my image classifier. I only did GBIF in this uh, go around. Okay, thank you, that was awesome. Uh, I just want to make a comment on the machine learning aspect. I thought that was a really cool project and a cool application. Um, have you thought about using neural networks instead of random forest? I feel like neural networks nowadays have a lot more flexibility. It allows you to look at very complex re relationships among potential features. So it's something that I have thought about and I haven't necessarily fully explored it to, to, in all honesty. So it's something I'd like to explore more, but I just haven't gotten into it just yet. Okay, okay, yeah. And another thing that's probably more um, just a, just a, so it was about, say if you have multiple objects in the same image, I wonder whether it's possible to maybe do a uh, segmentation first to extract. Yeah just the part about the, the, mm -hmm. 
the shell. Yeah, that's, that's something that that's actually something that we do plan on doing. Like, I am not explore, uh, exploiting the localization part of the object detector at all. It's basically a glorified like classifier for multiple things in the image, and so I should be using that localization information more thoroughly. And so that's one of the plans to do. But ultimately, uh, I'll probably just be trying to get this into whatever publication ready form it is. And so uh -huh. that, that'll that may or may not make the final cut, <laughs> but it's definitely something we'd like to do. Yeah, I think that's probably more further down the line, but that's already very cool. Good job. Hey, I also have a question. I, I'd like to understand your process better. I think I heard you say um, you had over 12,000 training images. Um, are they, is that where the YOLO program was used to generate those labeled images to train on? Or are they somehow like hand labeled uh, collected images? They are indeed hand labeled. Uh, wow. Well, half of, <laughs> <laughs> so like half of them are ha hand labeled. So 6,000 are just random background images that I could just be like, give me a forest with nothing in it. And I can just be like, there's nothing here. Just create an empty text file for all of them. And that's it. And But then the other 6,000, yes, they are hand labeled. And I, yeah, so it was a bit of work. I almost went with Amazon Mechanical Turk for that, but we just decided to like spend a couple, like we had a lab meeting where we did it one time, and then we had a couple of other group meetings for this kind of work. And some undergrads were very helpful, like Brandon and Anna, who did a lot of hand labeling for me. But from one of your graphs showing um, the converging performance uh, with number of, I think, number of uh, the training size, I believe, it seemed like maybe you don't even need that many, uh, such huge um, training set. So I wonder if you could have uh, if, um, uh, reduced the training size, just make sure they're well balanced with each categories. Yeah, that, that's very true. I, I was just like, so I was just following the um, best practices in the GitHub repository. I was just trying to following the instructions more than anything else. So yes, I will. I could do a better job of evaluating the training set composition going into it. Hey Mason, good job. I have a question. I, from what I recall, I think that when you're um, when your database saw an ornamented or a non-ornamented, it always called those separate species. Is there ever a situation where one species can be ornamented and or non-ornamented? And I just wonder if, you know, studying those, if that exists, those might be good exactly. uh, ways to tease apart like alter, like phylogenetic effects and things like that. Yeah, that, that's what, that, that's exactly, so that, that was part of the reason why we do the dirty thing or we do the the GBIF approach, because like we're missing all the polymorphic species by doing this. Anytime there is a polymorphic species that's not being included in the analysis because it had too much variation and hit that 0.9 threshold. And so that is a bias in our approach right now, is that because we wanted to access things where we knew that they were reliably one type or another, we decided to forgo having that. So like there is a possibility of running that analysis with the like, just doing everything, calling everything as an ornamented or smooth based on its image and not including any kind of spatial records that are not, um, don't have an image associated with them and we could do that. But yeah, I hope that answers your questions. Yeah, I'm still thinking about it, but like, would it work to just like forget species? Like who cares what species it is? Just is it ornamented or not ornamented and just take that data set and... I would, yeah, I think that the issue is really just um, whether we gain more localities from doing that or it provides better information than those where we gain, like, so we're, we're gaining a lot of localities by doing the 90% classification on um, species because we get all those localities that don't have an image with them. And so, I haven't done the alternative yet to compare, but it could be a better data set, actually. Cool, yeah, interesting talk, thanks. Thanks. <laughs> well, anyway, I guess Dave left, so I'll be the one to end this today. Uh, thank you all for coming to my talk and Chava's talk, and uh, hope you all have a great rest of your day. <laughs>